OK, after that interlude, um, our next speaker is Raf Andrea, who I've had the pleasure of knowing since he was a graduate student at Caltech and through his time at Cornell and now and via Kiva Systems and now here at uh, ETH. But Manfred has a few remarks, I think. Actually, this time I don't know Raf Lang longer than you, I think. Uh, <laughs> I've also known him since he was a graduate student at Caltech working with uh, John Doyle. Um, what I remember is that uh, I was an examiner on his uh, doctoral qualifying exam, and he actually decided to do it together with uh, Fernando Baganini, uh, which is unusual. Usually it's one person taking the exam. They did it as a competition. So whatever one person couldn't answer, the other person took up the, the question. And I think this is, uh, was already an indication of his character and, and attitude, the competitiveness in this uh, exam. So Raf moved to uh, Cornell, as you heard, and then uh, uh, Peter Gehring uh, retired, Hans Peter Gehring, and um, then I called Raf, said if he would be interested, I talked to Lino Gutzella, um, if they would consider him under the committee, uh, came, everything worked out, I think that Raf speaks Italian helped, so <laughs> 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 thanks Raf for uh, Coming at last moment from Stockholm, from some yeah, it was a bit of a nightmare, yeah. Uh, technological breakdown, it yes. has, I heard. Uh, a very not resilient system, the air traffic control system. Thank you, Manfred. Um, so, what I'm going to talk today is actually really about education. Uh, it's how do we train people to deal with robustness and uncertainty. And the title is Downtime Demos, Competitions, and Live Performances as a way to as a way to train people. So there's really three key points. Lack of robustness is robotics Achilles heel. There's a big gap between what is adopted in the market in terms of robotics and the capabilities that think should be uh, deployed. There's a huge gap and it's really about robustness. The second is that it's really difficult to motivate robustness in a research environment. Uh, and the reason being the incentives are not there. Okay? Um, if you want to uh, come up with concepts, then robustness is not an issue. You just have to demonstrate the concept, and that's fair. Um, publishing papers, why deal with robustness? You just have to worry about getting the concept out and, uh, and getting your paper written. And the other part is that it's really hard. It's really hard to make robust systems, so why deal with it when there's no rewards for it? So the solution that, uh, that I've come up with in, in my kind of wandering way uh, is to impose it indirectly. And uh, so this is really... Uh, this talk is really about anecdotes. It's kind of how I've stumbled my way into this way of running my research group. And it goes back over 30 years. Back to 1989, I was a second year student in our design project. We had a team of four students, and the objective was to build a voice-controlled mechatronic device. Um, it was a year-long project, 20% uh, of, our, of our coursework. Mechanical, electrical, single board computer, and software. I was responsible for the software. It was supposed to be written in 6502 on the 6502 microprocessor in assembly language. Two weeks before the competition, we had a lot of the systems tested, the mechanical, electrical. I had tested my software in a way that I'll describe in a minute. The guy doing the single board computer kept on reassuring us, yeah, it's going to work, no problem, no problem. And um, he was just wrong. It just didn't work. We knew we were in deep trouble when we... Uh, had a look at his solution, and he was using, for those electrical engineers, you can understand this, he was using the output pin of the microprocessor as a ground pin for the other chips to make the routing problem easier. <laughs> so we knew we were in trouble, right? So we tried to redesign it. We didn't have enough time. Uh, so, you know, said, so what are we going to do? I had developed my software on my personal computer here, my ZX81, um, 8K operating system, kilobytes, 1,000 uh, bytes of RAM. Um, and I had uh, used it to develop the core idea of how I was going to do this voice control. I'll say about, uh, more about that in a minute. The problem was that it was written in the Z80 microprocessor language, and there was no simple way of um, really getting this information out to the rest of our system to control it. Fortunately, I had another computer, a Commodore 64, um, which used the 6510 microprocessor, which is very similar to the 6502. So the, so the idea we had was, why don't we just run the code on the Commodore 64 and use the uh, I.O. of the computer to, to run our system. We did some basic um, uh, tests. Uh, it worked, so we were very happy about it. Um, and basically what happened was uh, two days before the competition, 
um, we, my, uh, my girlfriend read pages and pages of hex code, because that's how assembly was written back then, uh, to me uh, uh, during the night. Uh, I typed it all in, and then she read all of it again, and I made sure that it was correct. We went to sleep because we were dead tired. And next morning, we hooked it up to our interface board, and we tried it. And I know this, this doesn't sound impossible, but it worked the first time. Um, lucky, uh, we did a lot of integration testing with, uh, with my previous version of the code on the Z80. Um, it, was a, it was a huge learning experience for me. And let me tell you what the three uh, basic lessons I learned was. One is, what is the simplest algorithm that does the job? We were the only ones that were able to get this voice-controlled mechatronic device working. Most folks were reading research papers on how to do voice recognition. Um, for people that know, know me, they know that I'm, uh, I like to do the least amount of work you know, to get the job done, and I did something really simple. All I did was basically digitize the voice and count the space between zero crossings and, that's, and, and bin that information. That's like a poor man's FFT. And I figured that was enough information to basically recognize 10 words, which is all that was required for the job, and it worked. The second one was integration, the strength of integration. We tested all these components separately, except for the single port computer. Um, and that's why when, you know, at the crunch time, we were able to very quickly get the system up and running. So we did those two things right for the most part. The thing that we did wrong was the team. Okay? So the three of us were a strong team. The fourth person was not. The reason that we chose him as a teammate was because he was friends of the other two guys. And I really learned the importance of having a great team. Um, related to that, the girlfriend that helped me uh, you know, read all these hex codes and type them into my computer. I married her. She's my wife. <laughs> okay, so then 10 years later, I was an assistant professor at Cornell University, and I decided I wanted to learn more about mobile robots. We entered this competition called RoboCup, where uh, autonomous teams of mobile robots play against other teams uh, in a game of robotic soccer. Um, just a little short video to give you an idea of kind of what the system looks like. Most of this footage was taken um, in their final years of competition in 2004-2005. So these robots do a pretty good job of passing the ball to each other in the usual open space. Of course, the performance was not like at the beginning of the competition. It actually took quite a bit of time to get to this level of competency. Um, you know, what was the... What was the core of our system? It was really this receding horizon control. We really based it on this core idea that we would use relatively straightforward models, um, do um, receding horizon control, so do some sort of um, uh, optimization that would tell us what the best thing to do is in the short term, and then repeat that a step later. Um, and uh, this was really the key to our success uh, in the competition. So what are the lessons that I learned in RoboCup? So if, Maintainability, flexibility, reconfigurability. You, it's a team project. 30 students were working on it every year. Um, so you had to do these things to be able to, to organize everyone and to do a good job of the, of the team. But also, more importantly, was that the competition, because our system was so modular and reconfigurable, we could scout the competition, find out how they played, and very quickly change our system so that at game time we would, uh, we would exploit their weaknesses. The right abstractions. Um, if you look at the competition in the year, early years before we competed, robots moved in straight lines. And that's because it was top-down. They basically uh, developed their core AI algorithms, and then in order for those to run, you know, they had to assume that the robots moved in straight lines, and that's what we did. We did it bottom-up, and the way that I showed you, this abstraction of these motion primitives based on receding horizon control, and worked our way up. Uh, and, uh, and, and that was key. And, the, and the, the final one is the systems engineering issue. It's really you're as strong as your weakest link. Um, we did a lot of uh, 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 max min, right? You want to maximize your minimum. You want to you want to make sure that you're, as, uh, as I said, strong as your weakest link. Um, here's something else that we did. <laughs> Sometime later, uh, I did with some artists. It's called a robotic chair. Here you see its first live performance in 2006. It's a chair that falls apart <laughs> and puts itself back together again. It takes about seven or eight minutes to do that, so we're not going to watch that. We're just going to see a few segments of it sped up. Here you see it climb over some of the pieces that it fell on. You can see that it's doing some path planning to figure out what it should do next. And this was the part that was really magical to see this thing write itself up. 
and I'll talk basically more about that in a minute. So the robotic chair, say a little some more about it. It's an art piece. It's, uh, it's in the uh, permanent collection of the National Gallery of Canada. It's been exhibited in many places around the world. It's been uh, writ written up about, about. So what were the lessons of the robotic chair? One is how do you manage indeterminism? This chair falls apart in a different way every time. Sometimes it falls on top of its legs. Uh, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, every configuration is different. I had to develop a systems architecture how does this thing fall apart, and how does it put it itself back together so that it works every time? In fact, it's at the stage now where it pretty much works every time. The only time it doesn't work is one of the pieces falls out of the base. And, uh, and that, was, that was an interesting thing that we learned, is that actually was a feature of the system. So when something doesn't work, it becomes a feature. It's actually interesting because people then want to help it and throw the, throw the leg back on. Um, importance out of, the box is, uh, out of the box system. This is an important lesson that I learned doing, doing, this, uh, doing performance, was that you better make sure that your system is ready to go very quickly. You know, when you go to this theater, they have this uh, conference, it's kind of Canada's version of TED. You gotta make sure that this thing can be up and running very quickly. There's other people that want access to the stage, and that really allowed us to design the system in a certain way that we wouldn't otherwise. I think the most perhaps interesting lesson that I learned was that formal training is, is neither necessary nor sufficient. We know it's not sufficient. Right? We know that people can go to many years of school and not really be uh, uh, good practicing engineers, but it turns out it's not even necessary. The person that uh, did the mechanical design for the robotic chair is an artist who dropped out of high school, um, who uh, basically only had uh, elementary school math at his disposal, yet he was the one that designed the mechanical uh, part of this, of this robot. One of the best mechanical designers I've ever met, no formal training. He's so good that when I came here to ETH, I brought him with me, and he helped me get, get the, uh, the group and the lab off the ground. So this, this was a very eye-opening experience for me. Move on to Kiva Systems. Um, Kiva is a company that's developed this distribution uh, paradigm where thousands of mobile robots move inventory in distribution facilities. Instead of people walking around warehouses, the robots pick up inventory, they bring it to the people, the people grab it, they scan it, and, uh, and the orders are fulfilled. Um, it, is, uh, it was bought by Amazon in 2012, and it's now known as Amazon Robotics. Um, this is an interesting um, uh, um, simulation to give you an idea of kind of what's going on in a typical Kiva warehouse. You have thousands of these mobile robots. You have you know, tens or hundreds of these picking stations. You have stuff on the right-hand side, uh, my right-hand side, your left-hand side, that is uh, replenishing at the same time that it's picking. Um, and there's a lot of indeterminism in the system as well, right? Things are, uh, orders are coming in in ways that you don't expect them to come in. Uh, people behave in ways that you don't expect them to behave. What were some of the key lessons that I learned at Kiva Systems? One is the interplay of architecture and algorithms. As the system architect, I had to figure out how to make this thing work. And, um, you know, it wasn't... We always focus on algorithms, especially in, a, in an educational environment, but it turns out that algorithms are just a small piece of it. The architecture is just as important, if not even more important. How do you, how do you break the system up um, so that different people can work on different parts of the system at the same time? How do you manage the information structure and at what rate is that data exchanged? And that has to go uh, part and parcel with the algorithms, because the algorithms are going to be the things that process the data. The two really need to go together, and they're just as important uh, uh, as, uh, as each other. The other part was interesting for me is, is adaptation. Kiva would not exist if it was not an adaptive system. Adaptive at many levels. Um, the more the system runs, the better the robots navigate. The more the system runs, the better um, resource allocations decisions are made. Um, that allowed us to make the system inexpensive from a hardware perspective, otherwise the robots would have cost way too much if they had to come off the, as soon as they were deployed, they had to be high performance. We just wouldn't be able to afford it. And we would have left too much performance on the table if this system didn't adapt and learn uh, about its operating conditions. The other thing that I learned <laughs> is something obvious, is that when you're working on distributed systems, if n is large, the number of things that you have, uh, then, and p is the probability that something can go wrong, you better make sure that p is really, really small. 
because otherwise uh, you're going to have a lot of breakdowns. Uh, at the time that we did Kiva systems, the, average, uh, the mean time between failure of a mobile robot, this is around 2003, was, uh, was something like 27 hours. Imagine 1,000 robots in a warehouse running 24-7 if that was the mean time between failure. Okay? There's no way you'd have a viable system in place. So the importance of making really, really, really robust, reliable subsystem components. The other thing that I learned is that dividers make really good mattresses. <laughs> this is a picture uh, about three months into the company when we were getting ready for a Series A investors to come and visit. I'd been up all night writing code, and uh, uh, Mick took a picture of, uh, of me waking up. So uh, it was a fun, fun lesson. So when I moved to ETH... Um, I decided I want to take all the things that I had learned and incorporate it into my, into my research group, into the way that I operate my research. So the first thing is that I wanted to work on interesting, challenging problems and be architecture and algorithmic agnostic. I didn't have specific tools that I was developing and built test beds to test them on. It was actually the other way around. I would build things that I was really interested in controlling, and then I would figure out what's the best algorithm, what's the best architecture to make the thing work. The second was that I wanted to develop a culture of zero downtime demos. I wanted my students to basically grow up in this environment where they're expected that their stuff always works. So, you know, I tell them, if, if I come into your office, uh, be prepared to give a demo in five to ten minutes. Um, and, and, it, and it works. You know, it doesn't have to be the exact latest thing you're working on, but you should always have something that works. And uh, there's huge benefits of doing this. Uh, they actually make better progress in their PhD work by having something that always works, by taking the initiative, the, the, the time at the beginning to, to really have a system that always works. It just allows them to, have, to do more tests, to do more research. It also, it also allows them to focus on the important things, right? Um, to focus on things that really matter as opposed to something that maybe you can only get to work once. So this, is a, uh, th this was a very important uh, part of starting my research group here. And the last one was the public performance aspect. I wanted us to take our system out of the lab and, uh, uh, and make it work outside of, uh, you know, outside of our walls. And the, the, the reason to think about it is zero downtime demos, that's really about learning how to cope with the known unknowns. Public performances are there to cope with the unknown unknowns. Okay? There's a, those, you have to be able to be able to do both in order to build uh, robust systems. So I'm going to give you just a quick outline of some of the things that we've developed uh, here in the research group since that time. This is a picture of the balancing cube. That was, uh, this is a picture that's actually from IFAC from several years ago. Uh, Sebastian Trimpe is the PhD student that worked on it. And we use this as a, as a test bed for distributed estimation um, and, um, and also distributed control, but mainly distributed estimation. Um, some of the details of what you see here, these modules are, have, are completely um, uh, self-contained computational units. They share information, and from that information, a state estimate is made. What you see here are some examples of uh, event-based state estimation. The idea is actually quite simple. Sebastian uh, is the one that uh, came up with the idea for, the, for this testbed and is now doing research in this area as a, as a researcher at MPI, is that each subsystem runs two two estimators. One, estimate, one estimator runs on global information that everybody shares, and another one runs on this global information plus local information. If there's a discrepancy, discrepancy between those two estimators, send your local information to everybody else, because then everybody else really has a different state estimate of what you have. And it turns out that by doing that, you can get um, uh, um, a lot less communication with very small sacrifice in performance. Another uh, public exhibition that we did is the Flight Assembled Architecture, where we built this 1,500-module uh, mo structure uh, in front of a live audience at the FRAC Center in France using a fleet of uh, flying machines, quadcopters. You see a little video from, from that experience. So this was done in uh, late 2011, before Amazon announced their package delivery. So we were doing package delivery uh, quite a few years ago. Of course, the package here was only a foam brick. But we had to learn about coordination, how to cope with uh, loads, um, and uh, you know, in a dynamic task, putting these things down relatively accurately. Um, there's a lot of interesting aerodynamics that go on when you're carrying objects such as this. Um, we've continued uh, you know, our public exhibitions here. You see a picture from Hanover Messe. We also did Google I.O. We also did uh, two TED 
performances, um, always in front of hundreds of people, always, you know, very professionally, always making sure that the system works. This is not typical in a research environment. My guys take it for granted, you know, that this is, okay, this is what you do in a research group, but it's, it's, it's really quite unusual. And here, a short video of some of the things that uh, we've been working on. Okay, so um, that's our research. Uh, where, where is it going now? Uh, tell you one of the things that's come out of it is a startup company, uh, Verity Studios. Um, and its business model is to develop high performance, high reliability autonomous systems and use entertainment as its vertical. In the process, develop a unique IP portfolio. What better way to develop robust, reliable systems than in situations where it has to work all the time in front of a paying audience? Here you see a um, an, uh, to, uh, to come press release. It's going to be uh, released in a couple of weeks of a show by Cirque du Soleil called Paramour on Broadway. The show opens next week, and um, um, you can see, you can imagine what uh, what our contribution to this show is. And here we have a preview to the preview, um, and uh, um, uh, this is not released. It will be released soon, so please don't tape this or take pictures of it. Okay, so that's next week. We're pretty nervous about it, but uh, um, it's been running in previews. It's, it's doing really well. It, it's not a mo it doesn't use motion capture for those that uh, understand uh, how some of the research that we do in the lab is. It uses new localization technology. Um, so we're pretty excited about it. So, you know, it, is there a verdict on how well the system works? Um, you know, again, it's about people. So it's interesting to see, you know, what kind of people does this type of system produce. There's a list of the PhD students that, and postdocs that have uh, come through our group since 2008, graduated, um, and um, you know, what are they doing now? Startup, 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 startup. <laughs> startup founder, 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 startup, group leader, MPI, system professor, startup, startup, system professor, startup. What do all these things have in common? Entrepreneurship. You have to be an entrepreneur to be a professor, okay? Most people don't think that, but it, you really have to sell your ideas and you have to know what problems to work on, and there's a big component of that. So it's interesting. I think what this produces is folks that, are, um, that know about risk-taking, that understand risk, that uh, know when to take risks and when not to take risks, um, and, and that have skill sets that are you know, useful in an in a, in a entrepreneurial environment, in a startup environment. 
This is done without um, you know, sacrificing uh, traditional academic um, uh, performance metrics, such as winning awards, publishing papers, etc. These are the major PhD awards that have been won by folks, folks in the group. Some of these are extremely high-profile awards. So, you know, in concluding, uh, I'm going to kind of wind things down. Robustness is more important than ever, and there are three reasons why. The first is that it is ridiculously easy to the cl close the loop on almost anything. We basically have, are giving matches to everyone. That's what we've done. Okay. So anyone can close the loop. And we want to close these loops on very critical infrastructure, some of the folks that have talked about uh, here in the, uh, in the, in the symposium. Um, and self-driving cars. Yeah, that's a very critical infrastructure, transportation. This is going to happen. Okay. And the key point is that it's much, much broader than tools. Tools, of course, are important. We have to continue developing tools for making robust, resilient systems. But we also have to train people on how to deal with these systems. And I want to give you some analogies, try to make connections. Hopefully, things that are obvious, you can then translate to how we should design systems. Okay, so, would you go to the wilderness with these two guys? Okay. The guy, the guy on, on, uh, on your left, clearly not. The guy's not fit enough to, to be in the outdoors. It doesn't matter what tools he has, right? He's just not equipped to do it. The guy on the right has too many tools, right? And he has the wrong ones. Okay, so you wouldn't, want, you wouldn't feel comfortable about going into the wilderness with him either. Right? So let's just make the, make the connection. Tools are important, but so are other things. Here's another one. Um, this is maybe a little bit more contentious. I get in trouble when I talk about this. Um, safety can be bad. Okay? These are products that you can buy. This is to protect your little, your little child from banging, banging her head. The other one is your child in the playground with a helmet to make sure that they don't get hurt. The problem is, is that this is, in my opinion, this is not good, right? It's important for kids to learn, you know, pain is, pain is feedback, right? Pain tells you, hey, that's, not, that's a bad thing to do. And the best time to learn that kind of stuff is, is when you're a kid, not when you're 20 years old. Um, I remember when, when I moved to Ottawa for, for my professional experience here, there was a guy, uh, he was a tall fellow, he was uh, uh, almost two meters tall, and we were playing frisbee, and uh, we threw a frisbee at, to him, and... You know, he'd always been tall all his life. And the Frisbee was this high over his fingertips. And he, you know, he didn't jump to grab it. And he said, well, you know, we said, well, why didn't you just jump? And he goes, I don't know how. He had never jumped in his life. <laughs> right? And uh, so, you know, the, you can, you can, safety can be bad, right? Um, you know, you want to put people in situations where they can fail. And uh, when it doesn't count as much. And the university environment is the perfect environment to do that. But this also applies to our systems. Um, and this is not the way we design. We don't design systems so that we can learn as we deploy them what, uh, how, how they should fail so that we can improve them over time. We, there's this pressure to always make sure that systems work right off the bat. So the key there is, is the right mix of you know, what, what failures can you, can you have when you're out in the field that are acceptable so that you can learn from them, so that you can improve your system and put them in situations where you really get high performance out of them. Uh, I remember uh, recently I, I was in Canada, and uh, I saw this, and you know, I I wept basically. You know, and in the Toronto area, steep hill, no bicycle riding. Now you're looking at this, and you're thinking, surely they don't mean this. There's something further up ahead. No, they actually mean that. <laughs> okay, so you know, basically protecting people from themselves. This is not the right way to 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 have people that can cope with the real world by insulating them too much. And the same thing applies to our systems. The next day I flew back to Switzerland and I was going for a walk and I walked through a playground and you see these kids that have climbed on trees that are kind of sitting on branches. They're not wearing helmets and their parents are nearby and I was thinking, this is, this is good, right? Um, my daughter is three and a half years old. She loves to ride her little scooter. You know, of course, when we go out in public places, she wears a helmet. But when she's in a playground and there's no one around and it's flat ground or on our driveway, which is flat, you know, I tell her not to wear a helmet. And my wife gets mad at me. And when other parents find out, what, what, your kid is not wearing a helmet? I go, yeah, she's like, you know, let her, let her ride around. And if she does fall, right, she'll learn that what she was doing was not the right thing to do. And the, and the, and the chance of her getting hurt are so small that there's so much more to be gained by having her have that experience. So again, it's this, it's this thing about not being overly, overly protective. Yeah, this is the contentious part. My wife does not agree with me, and maybe, and a lot of you uh, probably don't either. Um, 
Okay, so I was asked to, 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 you know, to mention how our, our paths met and at the beginning, but I decided to do it at the end of the talk. Um, and uh, as Manfred said, it was, uh, it was a, during the qualifying exams. It's a picture of Manfred when he was, when he was a professor at, uh, at, uh, at Caltech when we were going through the process. Now, I have to say that I was really intimidated by Manfred, okay? And uh, most people are. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, there were... You know, there were three, fo three folks on the controls uh, in, our, uh, in, in, our, uh, in our qualifying exams, and the one that I was really worried about was Manfred. You know, uh, Richard, um, Richard Murray, you know, he was our age. He was in his 20s. You know, he's not going to fail me, right? <laughs> John, John Doyle, you know, I was on the soccer team at Caltech, and he had even come and see me play. He'd even see me, he even saw me score a goal the winning goal on a penalty shot, and it was against USC. There's no way he was going to fail me. <laughs> right? But Manfred, Manfred was a different story, right? So there was a... <laughs> right? So, uh, so I was very relieved when I passed the qualifying exam. Uh, another anecdote about, about Manfred, and this kind of... that he's in, You know, he can be intimidating, was uh, when I was a professor at Cornell University, I was a good friend who was in the faculty of, uh, of uh, chemical chemical engineering, and uh, Manfred uh, uh, did some advising for, uh, for the department, and uh, you know, uh, this person confided in me that Manfred had a nickname. I don't know if Manfred knows this, and the nickname was The Dark One. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's how I met Manfred, and, and also, as Manfred said, you know, we kept in touch, and in 2000, 2003, 2004, he invited me to, uh, to give talks at ETH, uh, he was uh, very supportive of the research that I was engaged at the time. One of them was flying vehicles, and uh, the other one was this idea, uh, this company that I had just, uh, I was on sabbatical, that I just founded with Mick Mounts and Pete Werman, uh, Distrobot. And these are some of the actual things that I showed during my talk back then, some of the things that we were doing for traffic management um, of, uh, of uh, many, many vehicles. At the time, we thought many, many vehicles was in the dozens. Of course, later we scaled up to 1,000. I knew I was on the right track when you know, I presented this and Manfred asked lots of questions and afterwards we talked and you know, he was very enthusiastic. And not once when I, when I asked him his opinion did he, did he say or go, well, if you know him, you know that that means that's a really bad idea. <laughs> right? And that's if he likes you. And if, and if, he, you know, if, he, doesn't, if he doesn't know you, or, you know, uh, he'll just say, that's just a bad idea. Right? So I, I knew it was on the right track. It was very important for me to have Manfred appreciate what we were doing, of course, with Manfred's uh, uh, ability to do cutting-edge research and do cutting-edge applications. This was a real affirmation that what we were doing was, was the right thing to do, and um, uh, it was very important for me. To conclude, um, you saw the, uh, the, um, the gist of my talk. Uh, I just want to say the last thing about Manfred is that... Um, you know, it's a big loss for ETH that Manfred, uh, Manfred is leaving. Um, on the other hand, it's a great opportunity for him. Um, you know, the world is still his oyster. Um, I'm looking forward to, to the, see the things that he does next. It is going to be hard for us to, to go on ahead without him. Uh, hopefully, especially with Emilio Frazzoli from MIT coming, I think hopefully with all of us, we can approximately cover what Manfred did on his own, but uh, we'll see if that happens. We'll do our best. Thank you, Manfred. Yeah, sure. I like questions. Uh, any questions for Raf? I saw your presentation at TED, actually. Oh. And, uh, Which, 2013 or 16? 16. Okay. The video only. I was not there. But I know there is high-caliber people there. How did they allow you to fly all these drones over them? Next question? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you afterwards. <laughs> John. That's a good question, right? So who's going to pay for this robustness? Because all the, if you look at this from a game theoretic perspective, there's, there's, um, there's no incentive for people to do this. So uh, if I 
maybe kind of extrapolate your question. Why should a company invest in robustness, right? If you do and nobody else does, and, and there's many, many other competitors out there, by luck, some of them are going to do better than you because it's easier for them to not build a robust system, and they'll be lucky it doesn't work, and they'll put you out of business. It's kind of related to the, uh, perhaps the, the, the talk before me in terms of these kind of interesting game theoretic aspects. Um, I think that uh, it's the job of uh, you know, funding agencies to make sure that that gets funded properly at, at the core level, right? So the uh, SNF funds my research, and they like the way that we're operating our research, and we're kind of teaching folks how to deal with robustness and uncertainty, so they're funding it, funding it as well. Uh, companies, collectively, they can, you know, it, it, if any one of them on their own decides to really push this robustness agenda, they're going to lose in the marketplace. But if they join forces with other companies in similar markets, put aside a certain amount of funds to do this because they realize that it benefits all of them, then, you know, that has an advantage. Those are two ideas. What do you think? I think we have a culture of all paper. And I think that's really bad. It is bad. And a hundred years will all be gone and I'm not alive. <laughs> 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 that, you know, Kumal gave this talk. I mean, it was a wildly optimistic talk. Uh, I was nice to hear somebody say something optimistic about the global warming, but you were impressed. Yeah. Um, I think when it comes to r robustness and uncertainty, I think, I'm, uh, I think I'm pragmatic, but I am, by nature, I'm an optimist. And, uh, and I think I even delude myself yeah. in order to be optimist. And it's just a better way to lead life. And it's also, you know, it's, it's, it's like, um, um, you know, it, it's like uh, you're making a, what's the, there's no advantage in being pessimistic, right? So, you know. Question in the middle. Yeah, a fascinating presentation. So, quick question: You touched upon uh, the algorithmic approach to building things and more qualitative approach to using other kind of information and structure. So, in architecture, in the 70s, there was a very influential book written by Christopher Alexander, uh, "A Pattern Language," where he has, a, along with other authors, he has a collection of several patterns that other architects developed over several years, and each one is very small. It's one or two pages long. And they give you advice about how to design a good balcony, what are the features of a comfortable chair, things like that. Now, in our engineering education, the equation and the algorithm are certainly very well covered. Now, the structural decisions in architecture, which was pointed out by John Cassidy, by the way, very nicely, those are certainly covered, but more or less on an ad hoc basis and not very systematic. So that I even perceive there is a need for a nice book similar to Pattern Language of Architecture that would be for engineers. I, I would definitely value your thoughts on this. So I completely agree with you. Um, um, and the reason that that's not done uh, as much as it could be is that, one, it's hard to teach. It's easier to teach the very quantitative stuff. Um, the other part is that the faculty that teach are not rewarded in their research for doing that kind of work. They're, doing for th they're rewarded for doing things that are quantifiable, that are easy to, you know, to, not easy, but that you can write down papers about, and this kind of stuff you can't. This is why design took so long to become entrenched as a core principle in, uh, in engineering. It's because it was like design, that's just too soft. Why are you doing design? I think one, uh, one uh, the things that we need to do more, and it's not just architecture, law is the same. Um, business school, they have case studies. They have examples of, of how we should be doing things, and we should have a lot more of that in engineering, more case study-based uh, education. This is how it was done. This is how it was done here. Because you know, design is the thing that we are uniquely, as human beings, capable of doing that machines can't do. And it's funny that we are trying to make it into an algorithm. I think it's a completely wrong approach. Question over here. Yes. Um, just to get back to your question, John, um, assuming that Kiev system used some sort of robustness, my question would be how much did Amazon pay for that? For that? Oh, it's right. public knowledge how much Amazon yes, paid for Kiev. Yes, exactly, right? So I think there is a commercial case for robustness, right? Because that actually makes things work. They didn't care about robustness. Right? No? no. Okay. Then I mean, uh, it, no, in the sense, they just, they just cared about yeah. what this thing was able, capable of doing. You're okay. right. It, it, it is robust.
But we had very um, unique circumstances when we developed Kiva, so, uh, which helped us, right? Basically, we started Kiva in 2003. This was after the dot-com burst. Um, and so it was, there wasn't an appetite for funding startup companies. Um, so we had, didn't have a lot of competition. We were in, uh, robotics was not seen as anything that could really contribute to the marketplace, except for, of course, um, the traditional robotic solutions, certainly not, not, not mobile robots. They were just seen as, you know, uh, as a distraction. The original name of the company was Distrobot. We changed it to Kiva Systems because we didn't want to have anything as affiliated with robotics in the company because that would scare customers away. We didn't want to uh, emphasize that. Um, so we had an interesting grounds to develop Kiva Systems where we could actually do it right. Now, with all of this funding in robotics, I think that there's a lot of pressure in not doing it right. It's just basically the first one to market, right? Um, and uh, and that, that, I think that's John's point, right? It's who's going to pay for it? You know, we're taking a gamble with Verity because uh, the core premise there is that we want to build extremely robust and reliable systems. And we, and we have this hope, and we've taken investment to see us there. We hope that people recognize the importance of this. The verdict, you know, the verdict is out. Uh, a couple of years from now, we'll see where they are. Final question. Splendid. And um, thank, let's thank uh, Raf again. Brilliant talk. Thank you.